Good morning, everybody. Hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful, and a blessed week. And God is good. And all the time. Praise the Lord. Uh, for the rest of the announcements, please turn to your bulletins. There are some other uh, impo important announcements, uh, but we want to share those that were probably the most uh, impactful for the whole community. Here, so uh, please go ahead and uh, refer to the announcements uh, in the bulletin. There's actually a lot of things going on uh, within GCC, and that, that is generally the case. And we don't want to just be doing things for the sake of doing things. Everything that we do here at GCC is for the uh, you know, for the purposes of God, for the, for the kingdom of God. And so I, I pray that and I hope that you will, you know, get active and plugged in on all the various things uh, that, that we are doing. And there are some other important announcements uh, as, as well re regarding uh, your, your uh, taxes uh, coming up and, and things of that nature. So please, please take a look at that. Uh, this is important stuff. I do want to talk about the Friday night uh, gathering uh, starting this Friday. We're going to be meeting every Friday except for the first Friday of every month. And basically what we're doing is we're following the schedule that the youth is, youth is following. They're also meeting every Friday of the, or every Friday um, except for the first Friday of every month. And the reason, reasoning behind that was we wanted to give an opportunity for people to get to bed a little bit earlier, maybe, and then come out to the early morning prayer service on the first Saturday of every month. So please participate in the Friday night gatherings and please come out for the Saturday morning early, uh, early morning prayer services as well. I preached this uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, Pastor Hyung will be preaching uh, next month and then we alternate like that. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful time. I don't know if you've ever uh, had a chance to participate in that or come out to that. It's really, it is early. I mean, I, I am not going to lie. It is early. But once you sort of, uh, you know, just uh, wipe out the, the cobwebs in your head in the morning uh, and then come out, it's, it's really, really a good time. And we have an opportunity to fellowship with our uh, KM brothers and sisters as well as uh, the, the youth kids there and everything. It's, it's the whole family of GCC together. It's really nice. So come out, all right? But do, please do come out for the Friday night uh, gathering. What we're going to be doing, initially anyway, is I'm going to be teaching on this thing called spiritual disciplines. And what spiritual disciplines are, are really a means of grace. We know that God is sovereign in all things, and God is everywhere. And God really wants to pour out His grace upon us in every way possible. But the thing is, we have to tap into God's grace. And the way we do that are through these things called spiritual, discipline, spiritual disciplines or means of grace. One way to think about it is uh, electricity. I know every analogy has its problem, but one way to think about God's grace is electricity. And it's, you're not, it's everywhere, but you're not going to really uh, channel the energy of that electricity until you plug into it. And that's the way it is with the uh, spiritual disciplines and the means of grace. And this is what we're going to be talking about over the next uh, nine weeks uh, through, through this uh, study on Friday nights. After that, Pastor David is going to start teaching on evangelism on Friday nights as well to the, for the EM congregation. He started that already with the KM, and he's going to be rolling that out to the Acts group, the, the, the KM young adults, as well as the EM as well. So uh, get in the habit of coming out now. You're going to learn some good stuff about the spiritual disciplines and how to tap into the means of grace that God has provided for all of us. And then we're going to roll right into the evangelism training that uh, Pastor David is uh, rolling out to the entire church. So, come out. Amen? amen. All right, you said amen. Um, today, as has been mentioned a couple times already, is Super Bowl Sunday. And um, one of the things that I love about football is that, it, it's pretty intense. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to play uh, any kind of organized sport, uh, but football, it's very, very intense. Every player, it may seem like chaos out there, but every player has a role, and every player, when they play that role in a disciplined kind of way, uh, that's how the team functions most effectively. And usually, what everyone is doing on the team a football team, and this is probably the case with every, every team really, is they are making sacrifices for the sake of the whole team. That's what they're doing. Every member on, out in the field is making a sacrifice for the good of the other members of the team and for the, for the whole team so that they can, uh, so that they can win. And it's a, it's, really, it's a very powerful metaphor, I think. And I, I wish more and more kids would, would do team sports and 
particularly something like football, especially Asians, because we, we're like underrepresented in, in football, I think. Um, and yeah, those guys can, can get pretty big, but Asians can get pretty big too, I, I think. So it, it is a good sport. Um, it's good to get knocked, knocked over every once in a while too. I think from my experience, it's been good for me, I think, except I've lost a lot of my memory in certain things, but it's good. It's good stuff. And it's fun for the kids, really fun. Not to leave out the women. Of course, there's, there's good team sports for for women as well. Nowadays, women are playing football too, which just boggles my mind. But uh, that's, that's the world that we live in. But yeah, football is a wonderful metaphor, a powerful metaphor about the sacrifices that we make for the good of a team and uh, the good of other members of the team. And last week, I started uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, I want to go through the whole chapter, but I was only able to get through the first half of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But what this uh, uh, chapter tells us is uh, Paul... He tells us that the Corinthians, they misapplied the greatest commandment. They misapplied the greatest commandment for their own selfish purposes. They wanted to continue in, that, in their idolatry. And so they, uh, they did that by misapplying the greatest commandment. And, and my hope and my prayer for us through this passage and through this word is that we flee from all idolatry uh, by correctly applying the greatest commandment. Last week, we talked about loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. This week, we're going to focus on uh, loving your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing and talking about today. So let's go ahead and open up our text. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm reading from uh, the NIV as usual. And I'm going to read through the whole uh, passage, whole chapter once again. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 1. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak, bro so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. And this is the word of God. Blessed be the reading of God's word. So last week I talked about how people in the Corinthian church, they wanted to, they, they wanted to continue in their practices. They wanted permission from Paul uh, to participate in all kinds of festivals and celebrations and uh, things of that nature. And the problem back then, and maybe the problem even now, is that uh, all of these uh, things that they participated in, and it was in, in the context of a culture that was very polytheistic. People, for the most part, they believed in all kinds of different, different gods. And most of these celebrations and festivals and activities involved idol worship in some way. And at, at least it involved the eating of food that may have been and probably was sacrificed to an idol. And they knew that participating in all these things uh, was not a part of Paul's teaching. He objected to uh, these practices. But they, they didn't want to give up. They didn't want to give up 
uh, the connections that they had through these celebrations and festivals and, and practices and, and uh, clubs and things of that nature. They didn't want to give up their social connections. They didn't want to give, give up their business connections. They didn't want to give up their family connections. So they, uh, they needed some reason to give to, call, give to Paul so that they could continue uh, in, in doing these things, doing the things that they wanted to do. But Paul tells them, you know, we all... Uh, they, tell, they tell Paul, we all possess knowledge, and the knowledge that they claim to have is that an idol is nothing at all in this world, and that there is no, no God but one. And since they know these things, they should be able to, uh, they should be allowed to participate in all these activities, because there's really no spiritual significant, uh, significance in any of these things uh, whatsoever. And, uh, and as I mentioned last week, uh, what we have here is a classic case of what is called proof Texting, proof texting. And proof texting means you're taking some verse or passage out of the Bible. You're taking it out of its context, and then you're using it for some, some behavior uh, that you're doing. And the Bible verse that the Corinthians are taking out of context and proof texting is Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this, this verse is where they get their knowledge that there is no other God but one. But Paul tells them in verse 2, you know, you think you know something, but you really don't understand what's going on here. He's telling them that they have misunderstood and they have misapplied uh, what this verse is really saying. And then he proceeds to tell them how they have misapplied this verse in two ways. First, Paul says in verse 3, whoever loves God is known by God. And by saying whoever loves God, what he's pointing to is the very next verse, Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And this is the first half of what we call the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment. What Paul is doing here is pointing out to the Corinthians that, uh, that if God is one, and there is really only one true God, which as believers, all of us know this, as Deuteronomy 6.4 tells us, then God is worthy. He's worthy of our complete, complete, total adoration, complete, total devotion, as Deuteronomy 6.5 tells us. In other words, the correct application for the fact that the Lord our God is one is not compromising your lifestyle to the idolatry of the world. The correct application of the Lord our God is one is complete wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That's what Paul is telling him. This week, we're looking at the second part of this chapter. And Paul summarizes the entire chapter in verse 6, which says, if you follow along, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Now, the fact that the Lord is one and that everything came from God and everything, uh, that everything came through Christ what that tells us is that everything in all of God's creation, everything that God has created in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not. All of creation was good. In fact, very good, according to God's plan, uh, as it tells us in Genesis, Genesis 1. This is good knowledge to have, but the important thing to remember is that we have to do something. We have to do something. We have to live for God. And then we have to live through Christ. And last week it was, it was talking about living for God and what that means. And this week it's going to be about living through Christ and what that means. Being like Christ. That's what it means to live through Christ. And basically it boils down to this one thing. is to love your neighbor as yourself. To sacrificially love your neighbor as yourself. And so verses 7 to 13 shows us two ways that we are to live through Christ. And the first one is this. We live through Christ. When we live through Christ, we understand others. Through Christ, we understand others. Now, this is about empathy. Empathy means that you understand where other people are coming from. You understand where other people are coming from, and you understand their feelings. That's what empathy is all about. 
So have, after having laid down uh, this whole, uh, the truth of his teaching in, in verse 6, Paul says in verse 7 that not everyone possesses this knowledge, and the knowledge that he is talking about is the fact that all things are from God and all things uh, are through Christ, and therefore food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do eat, like he says in verse 8. And not everybody uh, gets this. Not everyone get this, gets this. And, and for those who don't get it, when they eat food that has been sacrificed to idols, they may think that it has been sacrificed to an actual God. Sacrificed to a real, actual God. Because their consciences are weak. That's what Paul means. Their conscience is weak. Their conscience gets defiled. In other words, these lifeless idols, in their heart and mind, in the heart and mind of these people with weak consciences, these lifeless idols become alive. And they become real. Now, the strong-minded person, they said, well, okay, I know how to solve this problem. They just need to correct their thinking. That's, that's all they need to do. They need to change their thinking. But it's not as simple as that. And so Paul explains to them why their weak consciences are thinking the way that they do. He says that it is because they are still so accustomed to idols. Those with a weak conscience are still so accustomed to idols. These people, they have been raised up in a culture that is saturated with idolatry. Like, uh, like I mentioned from Tony Evans, their culture was saturated in idol worship. Idol worship has been a part of their worldview from the very day that they, they were born. So it's not simply a matter of switching off one worldview and then just making, uh, you know, changing life to think in another, in another way. We ourselves know that that is very difficult for us and that is very difficult for everybody. But then what makes the people with a weak conscience any different from people with a strong conscience? Didn't everyone back then grow up in the same culture? Uh, actually, that's not, exactly, that's not exactly right. Most scholars think that Paul was writing to a specific group of people who had specific questions, and he is responding to them through this, these people through this letter. And the thing is, the people that wrote this letter were probably, in all likelihood, the leaders of the church. They were the leaders of the church that wrote this letter to Paul, asking these questions to Paul. In other words, in all likelihood, the people that Paul was talking to and responding to, the people who wrote this letter were probably the best educated and the wealthiest people of that community. So what this means is this. If they were the best educated and if they were the wealthiest people in the highest socioeconomic status uh, of that community, they probably had an opportunity to have more exposure, more exposure to different philosophies and different worldviews because of their education and their exposure. And what that means, in all likelihood, is that they were less prone to idol worship just by their very nature. They were less prone to idol worship. But what were they prone to? They were prone to pride and arrogance. That's what they were, they were prone to. That's what they were prone to. So Paul is telling the strong that they need to understand where the weak are coming from and why they do what they do. Paul is not siding with the weak. He's saying that they are definitely wrong. But loving your neighbor as yourself begins with, with understanding where they're coming from. That's where loving your neighbor begins. In other words, empathy. That's where loving your neighbor begins, with empathy. So Paul is telling the strong that they need to understand what it means to be weak. Because every single one of us is weak in some way. Every single one of us has knowledge that we do not possess. Every single one of us, if we really reflect about it, and if we're really honest with ourselves, every single one of us bows to some idol in our hearts. But we can't see into the hearts of other people. We don't know what idols are in the hearts of other people and making them weak. We can't even see this about ourselves. But we can pretty much assume this. We can pretty much assume this, 
that every single human heart, every single human heart is prone to sin and idolatry. Like the great hymn says, like the great hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Knowing this, that is what empathy is all about. That is where empathy begins. Understanding others, that is where loving your neighbor as yourself begins. The second thing is this, is that through Christ, sacrifice for others. Through Christ, sacrifice for others. Now Paul says in verse 9, Be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, how are the Corinthians becoming a stumbling block to the weak? He says in verse 10 that because of their example, a person with a weak conscience might be emboldened to eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. But the strong person may say, yeah, so what? So what? Is that a big deal? So they follow our example and eat some, some sacrificial food. The, the sacrificial food, it doesn't mean anything because idol, the idols aren't real. And yeah, that's true in and of itself. That's not a problem. But Paul goes on to say, but what do you know what's going on in their heart? Maybe that person will actually stumble and fall into sin. Maybe all these false gods actually become alive and real in the hearts of the people with a weak, weak conscience. How do you know? And that definitely is a problem. But then the strong person may say, hey, everybody sins, right? We know that everybody sins, but God's grace is sufficient for us, isn't it? Isn't our God the God of second chances? But Paul says in verse 11, what if the person actually ends up being destroyed? How do you know the destiny of this person? Because of your act, how do you know where they're going to end up? And by destroyed, Paul does mean eternal damnation in hell. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about a temporary tripping up. When he says destroyed, he means spiritually destroyed. How do we know? Now the strong, they may have one more argument to defend themselves. They might, sell, they might say, okay, well, if the person is destroyed because they're following our example, doesn't that just mean that they would have been destroyed anyway? Isn't God sovereign? Isn't our salvation assured? Once you're saved, you're saved. And if they're not saved, that means that they were never saved in the per first place. Yeah, that's true too. That's also true. But get this. Paul says in verse 11, he says in verse 11 that this weak brother or sister who ended up being destroyed by following your example, that was someone for whom Christ died. Christ died for that person too. You see, we don't know whether any person is going to be saved or not. None of us have that ability to know. Only God has the ability to know who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. But one thing is absolutely for certain. Christ died for all. Christ died for everybody. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Now, this does not mean that everyone is going to be saved. Absolutely not. That does not mean that everyone is going to be saved. What this does mean is that Jesus died so that everyone might have an opportunity to be saved. Christ, he died for all so that they might have an opportunity to be saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now if that in itself is not incentive enough for the strong Corinthians to stop what they're doing. Paul says in verse 12 that causing any brother or sister to stumble, that in itself is sin. And not only are you sinning against that brother or sister, you're sinning against Christ himself. Wow. And no wonder Paul says in verse 13, if what I eat causes my brother or, sister to fall, brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. I know there's a lot of meat eaters out there. I will never eat meat again, 
so that I will not cause them to fall. For Paul, this, this is a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. And it's not like he's telling them to sacrifice their very lives so that the brother or sister won't stumble. He just wants them to sacrifice some of their personal rights, some of their personal freedom. That's all. So the bottom line is this. Knowing all these things, why in the world would any of us want to cause somebody else to, some, to stumble? And I know there is not a single person in this room, I hope, there's not a single person in this room that wants to cause anybody else to stumble. I'm sure of it. It's just that we don't think about these things very much. And we don't think about these things very deeply. But Paul is saying we should. We should think about these things. We should think about how our actions impact other people, especially within the community of faith. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. True love, true love is never, ever self-love. It's not. True love always loves others. True love is always a sacrificial love. And this is the kind of love that Jesus is talking about when he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Sacrificial love for another person. And this is what Jesus is talking about in the greatest commandment when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. It is a sacrificial love that is for another person. You know, between loving God and loving others, Jesus says, there's no other commandment greater than these. No other commandment greater than these. Now, Paul, there's something else to notice here. He gets absolutely no personal benefit and no personal glory for the sacrifice that he's making. He says, you know, if I'm going to call somebody to stumble, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to eat any meat. I'm not going to remotely eat anything that could be sacrificed to an idol. But that sacrificial act, it, he gets no personal benefit out of it. In fact, he loses something, the taste of good meat. Right? He loses that. And he gets no personal glory out of it. It's like, it's a big deal. <laughs> You're not eating meat. Who's going to, you know, monitor Paul to see if he's eating meat or not? Yeah, there's no personal benefit to him. And there's no personal glory in it for him at, at all. But this small sacrifice has a huge, huge benefit for others, for others. And what's good for others is good for the community. And this is what Paul's talking about, making sacrifices for others for the good of the community, because what's good for the community is good for every single person in that community. This is what Paul is talking about, and this is the benefit of our sacrificial love. And as I was thinking about this, and as I was reading this, I had to admit to myself and confess to God that I don't mind making sacrifices. I really don't. As long as there's some benefit for me. As long as I get some recognition and personal glory out of it. Right? Aren't we all like this? Before you throw stones at me, your pastor, you know, aren't we all like this? Yeah, I think we can admit that. It's okay to admit that. And we should admit that. Because every single one of us have that selfishness in everything that we do to some degree or other. But when it comes to making sacrifices where there's no personal benefit, especially when there's absolutely no recognition, not even recognition or notice from the person that's benefiting from it, that's really hard for us to do. It is for me. I, I readily admit that. At the very least, my heart needs to make an extra effort to make those kinds of sacrifices where I get no personal benefit. And when there's no recognition, no personal glory what, whatsoever. So I, I was looking for an illustration. I, I, I searched far and wide for an illustration that would really bring this point home where a little sacrifice that, where you get no personal recognition and no personal benefit goes a long, long way to benefiting other people. 
But you know what? I couldn't find a single thing, not one that really fit. But then no, duh, of course not. Because when you're making those sacrifices that go unnoticed by anybody, no one's going to write about it because they don't notice it. (laughs) They don't notice it. But they experience the benefit of it, don't they? They do experience the benefit of it, even if they don't notice it. But then it occurred to me, as I was searching far and wide for a good, powerful illustration to close out this sermon, is that I should be that illustration. You should be that illustration. We should be that illustration. So I want to close with two applications for us today. Two ways to make a sacrifice that go totally unnoticed and where there may be absolutely no personal benefit to yourself, but it will go a long, long way to benefiting this community here at GCC. And the first one is this. Give your tithes and offerings. Give your tithes and offerings. I'll say it again, brothers and sisters. (laughs) Give your tithes and offerings. And honestly, I don't say this for my benefit at all. You know, I'm still going to get paid. But there's something about giving your tithes and offerings that touches the heart of God. Because when, when you do that, without expecting anything back, like I said last week, it is the pure act of worship. You're telling God that you trust Him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And He does say, test me in this, and I will bless you abundantly. Give your tithes and offerings. And obviously, it will benefit our church. It will benefit GCC in some way, but not in the way that we think, probably. Not in a financial way. Because we are a 501c3 organization. We are what is called a non-profit. We're a non-profit organization. But your tithes and offerings, every single penny of it, will be used to build up the kingdom of God. Every single cent will be used to build up the kingdom of God. Through your tithes and offerings, somebody is going to get discipled. Through your tithes and offerings, the gospel is going to be proclaimed. Through your tithes and offerings, somebody is going to be saved. We've already witnessed this. Do you think that just happens out of thin air? Of course it's from God. Obviously, it's from God. But God was using us to do this. And part of that, a key part of that, is through your giving. So please, take this very seriously. And take it to heart. You won't get any recognition from it. I promise you. You won't get any personal benefit from it. At least not from a human perspective. You'll get plenty of spiritual benefits from it from God. He sees. Yeah. But it will go a long, long way to building up this community and advancing the kingdom of God. The second application that I want to leave us with is this. And you're going to say, how convenient. Come out Friday nights. <laughs> Come out Friday nights. And you may say, and I, I hope you believe this. I hope that you believe that if you, you, come out on Friday night, you will receive a personal benefit by being discipled. But then you might think, okay, that's great. But how in the world does that help anybody else? How in the world does that help anybody else? I'm telling you, it does. It does. Because it glorifies God, first of all, when God's people gather together to worship together and be discipled together. It just does. And not only that, when you come out, there's this thing called ministry of presence. Ministry of presence. Your presence there, your physical presence there encourages other people to come out and be discipled and to grow in Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. That is a very, very good thing. Every individual that gets discipled and built up, builds up the community. It does. That's how it works. Now, concerning both of these things, giving your tithes and offerings, and also coming out on Friday night, there's another benefit that I think that we very easily forget about. And Andy touched upon this, and I 
I feel that this is from the Holy Spirit as well. Just the act of your giving and just the act of your coming out, it sends a message to our children. It sends a message to our children that the church, the community of the church, is important. We are the body of Christ. We're just not any other random club, social club. We're the body of Christ. By you giving, by you coming out, you participating in the life of the church, you tell your children that the body of Christ is important. And I guarantee you that it will stick with them. They cannot help it. It will stick with them. Absolutely, positively guaranteed. And by the way, are there any remnant brothers and sisters here today? Any singles? It's not just about the parents. By your coming out, your giving, it's not just about the message to your children. Even if there are remnant brothers and sisters that are giving and coming out, participating, that also sends a message to our children. Because your children and my children, this breaks my heart. They respect the young guys more than they respect us, don't they? <laughs> yeah. So all of us together as a family in Christ, the things that we do matter for our kids. What are we teaching them? Are we teaching them that the church is just some, eh, okay, whatever. One hour, one and a half hours on Sunday. A cheap lunch. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Night. Is that what we're teaching our kids? Come on. Come on. We're the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. Let's do better. We can do better. And you can keep me accountable to that, too. Keep me accountable to that. I ask you to. So, I know that you're giving of your tithes and offerings, it's a sacrifice. It is. I acknowledge that. I know it. I know that coming out on Fridays, it's not easy. You know, you've had a long week. You just want to chill out and... Uh, <laughs> I would say something, but I'm not going to say it. Uh, you just want to chill out, maybe watch some Netflix, whatever the case might be. <laughs> right? So I appreciate the sacrifices that you make in your giving and your coming out especially since that there's absolutely no per personal benefit to, you, to yourself and on, a, on a grand scale. And there's going to be no personal glory for you except for what God sees, your faithfulness. But on human terms, not so much. But I promise, I promise that these sacrifices will go a long, long way in building others up, other people up. It will go a long, long way in building up GCC. Love, sacrificial love, sacrificial love that is in Christ. It always builds up. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Let's come to the Lord in prayer.